Well, good morning to you all and happy Thanksgiving. I am Pastor Steve, the church life pastor here at Bethel Assembly. Thank you for joining us online today. Well, whether you are having turkey, ham, goose, or pizza, or maybe you're meeting with family at Tim Hortons, I hope you're all truly thankful for friends, family, and the blessings of God on this Thanksgiving weekend. Well, let's jump right into our verse for today and try to unpack some of the truths that it contains. It is found in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. You know, I remember a few years back having some issues with my eyes. I explained to my doctor that I was seeing flashes of light off to the side. I told him, however, that the good news was that I was not hearing any voices. Well, in saying that, voices can be very helpful if they are reliable. Remember the first GPSs that we had? You know, the Garmin, the TomTom, -Tom, or the Magellan? They were not always all that trustworthy because they were not always up to date with the changes in, road, in the roadways and in our traffic conditions. Now our new smartphones that we, most of us have, they are constantly updated and current, and they keep us on a steady course letting us know about current traffic conditions, roadblocks, and getting us or keeping us on course. Actually speaking to us with voice commands, sometimes annoying, but voice commands that tell us things like, get in the left lane, prepare to exit in one kilometer, or do a U-turn, and if we don't obey, again, do a U-turn. Maybe another command like, let your wife drive for a while. That might be a good one, but I probably you haven't heard that from your GPS. It reminds me of the guy that was going down a one-way street the wrong way. An officer pulled him over and said, sir, where do you think you're going? He said, I don't know, but wherever it is, I must be late because everyone is going home. You know, when we came to Christ, it was the Spirit of God that instructed us or convinced us to do a U-turn, to do a 180, to go the other direction. And when we come to Christ in doing so, even though we're going in the right direction, sometimes it is possible to get off course or to wander a bit. Someone said, for every mile of road, there is two miles of ditch. We need to listen closely to our spiritual GPS, and I call that God's positioning sensor. Our scripture assures us that His voice, His word, and His spirit will keep us on the right path. The way that is straight, it's narrow, and the way that leads to life. You know, a good friend of mine shared with me recently about a business transaction that he did. And after he did it, he didn't feel quite right about it. He didn't feel like he was totally up front. And for a few months after the fact, this tiny voice kept reminding him of that deal, that, that it was wrong, that it wasn't quite right. Well, the other day he told me that he finally listened to this voice and he connected with the guy that he had the business dealing with and he cut him a pretty sizable check to give him some money back to make it right. Someone said your conscience is like your mother-in-law living inside of you. You see, God's voice is not always loud. It's not always boisterous, but it is always available. It's relevant. It's always reliable, accurate, and up-to-date. I hope that as you count the blessings of the Lord on this Thanksgiving weekend, that you will also be grateful in your heart for the loving voice of God that keeps you on the path. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for your voice. Lord, I thank you that you don't push us, but you, you uh, work on our lives, our spirit, Lord, in such a way that uh, you want us to follow these ways, your ways, the way, the truth, and the life that you are, so that we might have blessing in our lives. Lord, I thank you that you, you keep talking to us through your word, through, our, through your spirit, Lord. You keep talking us, to us sometimes with friends, Lord, to help us stay on this path, Lord. I pray that we would take heed to your word. We would take heed to your voice. We would listen to your promptings, O oh God, and that we would get to you know your voice. Even sometimes uh, uh, Samuel uh, didn't know your voice right away, but he, he learned your voice. He learned what your voice was like, and help us to learn what your voice sounds like. Help us to take the time to hear from you, God. Help us today, Lord, to be grateful in our hearts for everything, but especially for that still small voice inside of us. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up. 
Till I lay my head I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been
Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is one of my favorite times of the year. It's a wonderful holiday, isn't it? And you probably thought, uh, put a lot of thought into this weekend, where you're going to go, what you're going to do, who you're going to see, and what you're going to eat. That's important. Let's not forget that. I was hungry and I was thinking about the title of this message and I came up, up with the ingredients of Thanksgiving. A suitable title because Thanksgiving, for most right or wrong, more than giving thanks maybe, is eating food. It seems to be one of the main focuses. Now, I'm not much of a baker or cook. I'm, I'm pretty good at barbecuing. I can burn anything. 
I read a, of a turkey farmer who was always experimenting with breeding to perfect a better turkey. And his family was fond of the leg portion for dinner, and, and there were never enough legs for everyone. After many frustrating attempts, the farmer was relating the results of his efforts to his friends at a general store get-together. Well, I finally did it. I bred a turkey that has six legs. They all asked the farmer how it tasted. I don't know, said the farmer. I never could catch the stupid thing. I don't know if you're into turkey or ham or whatever it is, but I hope you have either had a good meal so far or will enjoy a good meal. What is your favorite part of Thanksgiving? Is it the food? Is it the family gathering? Is it the fun that you might have? Maybe it's all of those things. But to have a successful Thanksgiving, for it really to be truly meaningful, maybe there's a missing ingredient, and I want to help you out with that. I think it's faith. Giving thanks to the one who gave it all. See, if you get through a Thanksgiving without giving thanks to God, are you really thankful? Are you really full? Thanksgiving is an action word. It's more than remembering. It is giving thanks. And, and the most important thanks that we can give is thanks to God. Our faith should mean something every day. But on this special, wonderful weekend, why not be thankful even more and give him thanks? This morning, we're going to look at the ingredients of a happy Thanksgiving that I trust will affect every day in every circumstance and season of your life. And the key verse, if you want to flip to your Bible, is Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, 13, and 19. I'm, I'm going to read these. Verse 12 says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to be plenty, to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Verse 13 says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And verse 19 says, And my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. The three points in this message are really simple, but the order is important. Be, do, and have. Be, do, and have. Not have, do, and be. And there is a difference. Well, what is the difference? I believe that if we become what God wants us to be and to be content in our circumstances... And then do what he wants us to do. We will have all that we need. And be truly thankful and fulfilled. Faith filled. On the contrary, if we have all that we want. And do what we want. We will not be happy and content. Because faith, that ingredient, is missing. We'll work these things out in the next few minutes. But a bit of background to Philippians chapter 4. Paul is responding to gifts from the, the church in Philippi and they were blessing him. And while this verse is implied to many, applied to many situations, the immediate context indicates that Paul was acknowledging God's enablement to find contentment in all circumstances, whether he had a lot or a little. And his contentment didn't come from outward circumstances, which could change in a moment. Rather, it came from an inward self-sufficiency in Christ. Paul was saying, I can do all things through the one who continually empowers me. So the be, do, and have says it all. To be content, to do all the things with Christ's strength, you'll have your needs met according to Christ's riches in glory. The be content part, that's attitude. It's not based on circumstances, but a choice. The do all things with Christ's strength is an action through trust and dependence on God and the have all we need is accordingly Christ's supply. So Philippians chapter 4 verse 10 to 19 contains these three great promises for God's children that will serve us a thanksgiving lifestyle every day. Living out our faith. So through Christ, number one, we can be what we ought to be. We can be content. That godly attitude of contentment because of Christ. Paul says, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I found a list of questions you could ask yourself to determine if you're really a grateful person or not. Follow along with me. Number one, which do you tend to talk more about, your blessings or your disappointments? Number two, are you a complainer, always grumbling, always finding fault with your circumstances? 
Number three, are you content with what you have or always dissatisfied in wanting more? Number four, do you find it easier to count your blessings or is it easier to count your afflictions? Number five, do you express thanks to others when they help you or do you just take it for granted as your due? And the last one, would others say that you are a thankful person? Those are six important questions to ask. and I hope you've passed the test. Maybe you're a work in progress. Dr. Dale Robbins writes, I used to think people complained because they had a lot of problems. But I've come to realize that they have problems because they complain. Complaining doesn't change anything or make situations better. He says it amplifies frustration, spreads discontentment and discord, and can invoke an invitation for the devil to cause havoc with our lives. Complaining makes us miserable. A great chapter to go to is Psalms chapter 73. Let me just read some scripture starting with verse 2. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 12, Behold, these are the wicked, always carefree as they increase their wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my faith. In innocence I have washed my hands, for I am afflicted all day long and punished every morning. If I had said I will speak this way, then I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was troublesome in my sight until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Verse 21, when my heart was grieved and I was pierced within, I was a senseless and ignorant person. I was a brute beast before you. And then turns around, yet I'm always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and later receive me in glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth I desire no one besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He's turned it around in thanks as he was taking a look at what life was all about, full of faith, compared to having no faith but having everything else. And, and he compared the two, and he came to some good conclusions. He says, those far from you will surely perish. But as for me, it is good to draw near to God. I've made the Lord God my refuge that I may proclaim all of your works. In another psalm, verse 70, uh, 77, verse 3, it says, I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. I think you get the idea there. See, it, it's difficult to be content if you don't have enough. And it's impossible to be content if you have too much. So what was Paul meaning? How did it work it out for him? What was his secret? Paul's saying, I've learned to be content. The Greek means self-sufficiency and independence from others. And he uses this term to indicate his independence, if need be, of everything but Christ. Christ was his whole source of life, his sole source of life, his life, beginning and end. And the contentment that Paul is talking about doesn't depend on the circumstances or the state, whether much or little, but his dependence was on Christ. So he had a good attitude. And attitudes can change just like circumstances. But he says, I know. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. But for Paul, attitude should be consistent. And it was. And what was his secret? It was Christ. Not based on circumstances. Paul had learned this. He knew this. And such contentment is not a natural human response. Paul explained that his self-sufficiency was in Christ alone who provided strength to cope with all the circumstances, good or bad, much or little, as long as he had Christ. So how do you get to that lofty goal of contentment like Paul? It's important for believers to realize that biblical contentment is not fatalism or acquiescence to one's lot in life. That kind of thinking would smother God's ongoing Uh, guidance. Rather, contentment involves one's perspective on life. To have real contentment, remember that everything belongs to God and what we have is a gift from Him. Be thankful for what we have, not coveting what others have. Don't do comparisons and have unrealistic expectations and be selfish and, and forget as many blessings or complain. All those things can affect our attitude. Instead, ask for wisdom to live wisely 
with what we do have. Pray for grace to let go of the desire for what we don't have. Trust in God to meet our needs. And I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. Philippians 2 verse 5 says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. The same. Just think about that. Not, you know, close or slightly resembling or a touch of, but the same. Now, is that asking too much? I don't think so. Jesus died for us. He humbled himself. He served. He sacrificed. He loved. He cared. He forgave. He restored. That's not too much, is it? Our attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. It's possible. Psalms 91 or 9 verse 1 says, I will praise you. Lord, with all my heart, I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name. That's a choice. That is an attitude choice. And you have a choice. You can say, I will. Colossians 3, verse 15, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, from the NLT says, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Every time I think of you, I give thanks. Think and thanks. Well, the second is this. We can do what we ought to do. Paul says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. It's talking about action. Again, Dr. Dale Robbins, he continues saying, Complaining is the arch enemy of thanksgiving. The two cannot coexist in the same heart. When we feel tempted to complain, instead of filling our complaint, filing our complaint, We should file a praise. It will change your life. And going to scripture, Philippians 2, verse 14 to 15 says, Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. I think Christians should be the most thankful people on earth. He gives us every reason to be. And life is daily, and sometimes that's a problem that's just so daily. But on your to-do list, put give thanks every day. Have a thankful heart. Philippians 2, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Often we think that this verse only is to be used when there's really big problems or we've tried everything ourselves and asked the last measure. We convince ourselves we can't get through it this difficult spot, so we whip out this verse and we quote it like it's a power verse. And it is powerful. But shouldn't it be an everyday verse? And if it is an everyday verse, then we'll be thankful every day as well. Because we have this good attitude, we're content, and then we realize we live our Christian walk in the strength of Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Yes, the Christian walk is daily, but it doesn't have to be a drudgery. We could be thankful every day and yet there are things we we do not do not that we can't do them but we won't do them again it's it's a choice and wrapping this all up with thanks and giving thanks and finding reasons being content and all that when someone says I can't do this it usually means I won't do this and in the midst of circumstances that may work against us Paul is saying I can do all things through Christ Ephesians 5 19 says sing and make music in your heart to the Lord Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. Always is the key word, not just on Thanksgiving, but every day, whether you have little or a lot. In Hebrews 12, verse 25, another good verse, let us please God by serving him with thankful hearts. In Hebrews 13, 16, and do not forget to do good and to share with others for such sacrifices God is pleased. Thanksgiving is a doing word. We cannot have God's best by doing and having an I can't attitude. The truth is we're insufficient in ourselves anyways, but Christ can make us sufficient for any task ahead of us. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. And if you change your can't to can, your won't will change to will. That's how you have a lifestyle of being thankful Let's just think of that verse, I can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can. That's good. That's positive thinking. 
seems to be the main theme in, he, in Philippians. It brings joy and the joy of the Christian life. I can do. That's even better. That's positive action, not just positive thinking, but it moves into action. And we know the Bible says faith without works is dead. It needs to be more than talk. A positive attitude is best accompanied by positive action. And then Paul says, I can do all things. And that's even better. That's positive faith. Not just some things, but all things. Positive thinking, action, and opportunity. Positive faith. That is where God comes in. And our God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is work in us. We can do many things for God in our own strength. And then we find ourselves frustrated, weakened, and we give up. But we can do all things through Christ. And that's positive power. Joy is that main word in Philippians. And in, through, he uses as well us, it's secret. In Christ's strength, enough, it's more than we need. Faith can move mountains, not because of its own merit, but because God is omnipotent. He is powerful. The apostle points to a real supply of strength, not a mere sense of courage. It's in Christ. And these positives aren't to be found in ourselves, but, but God in us. It's only through Christ, Christ in us, and us in Christ that, that we're self-sufficient. Someone would say, well, I couldn't because I wouldn't until I could because I would. The things we can't do we can do when we do them for Christ and in his strength. Just thinking of this verse again, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Don't think that God only helps you when you need him. Don't think um, that you have to save his grace for a very serious problem, too big for you to handle. Don't hold out asking for a favor because you don't want to wear him out or or get him mad. Don't save your request for a rainy day. Instead, in faith, realize you need him more than you're aware. And he will be your strength. He will give you reason to live for him. He will show up in all your circumstances And with that spiritually godly attitude, you will be content. You will do what he wants you to do, and you will have all that you need. This verse can be divided into two halves. The first is, I can do everything. And to stop there and pull the words out of context would imply the idea of self-reliance and cocky uh, self-assuredness. And that's the kind of message that you hear from motivational speakers. You can do anything if you put your mind to it. But that's not what this verse is saying. The last half reveals the source of our strength. That's Christ. God wants us to accomplish much for him in this world, and it's through Christ. Instead of trusting in our own strength and abilities, we can rely on Christ and his power. And when we do that, we'll have all that we need. So the last point is this. We can have what we ought to have. Time magazine reported that a mugger held up a woman at gunpoint and demanded her money. But when she only had $12.50 in her purse, he became very angry. Then he saw her checkbook and insisted that she write him a check for $300. The next day, he was arrested when he tried to cash the check. (laughs) Not the smartest criminal. What do you need and how are you going to get it? Well, again, be content. Do things through Christ. Rely on him. And you'll have all that you need because of him. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, 8, If we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. In today's society, we have so much more. But still, so many are not at peace. They are not content. They, they have missed the point. They haven't experienced God's supply as enough. So this last verse, Philippians 4, 19, My God shall supply all needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let's think of that for a moment. God supplies. We're not limited to our own supplies or our own means, but God supplies. What we need is God's supply. So God supplies our need. Matthew 6, verse 31. It says, So don't worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? 
for the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. God supplies our need. And God supplies our need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He knows how to be personal. He knows how to meet your need because he already showed that to us through Christ who died on the cross for our sins, who gives us eternal life, who brings us into right standing with God that we can live this wonderful life of being content, living in the power of Christ and having all that we need. It's his supply that we need and he gives it and he meets our need. There's a beautiful prayer that goes like this. I asked God to take away my habit. God said, no. It's not for me to take away, but for you to give it up. I asked God to take my handicap, to make my handicapped child whole. God said, no. His spirit is whole. His body is only temporary. I asked God to grant me patience. God said, no. Patience is a byproduct of tribulations. It isn't granted. It is learned. I asked God to give me happiness. God said, no. I give you blessings. Happiness is up to you. I asked God to spare me pain. God said, no. Suffering draws you apart from worldly cares and brings you closer to me. I asked God to make my spirit grow, and God said, no. You must grow on your own, but I will prune you to make you fruitful. I asked God for all things that I might enjoy life. God said, no. I will give you life so that you may enjoy all things. I asked God to help me love others as much as he loves me. God said, ah, finally you have the idea. If we learn the secret of contentment through our dependence on Christ, we will have all of our needs met and we will live truly thankful lives. Not just on a Thanksgiving weekend, but every day of the year. Be content. Do all things through Christ and you'll have your needs met. Happy Thanksgiving and happy thanks living. Pray this prayer in the form of a poem. Let us be thankful as we gather this day for blessings bestowed by thy hand in thy way, for granting us life and meeting our needs, direction and guidance as we seek and you lead. We're grateful for family, for friends and for health, for your wondrous love, your bounty and wealth, for daily protection, abundant provision, for talents and gifts, for dreams and for vision, for your perfect timing, for hearing our prayers, for soothing and healing, for comfort and care, for your word that reveals all the answers to life, a light in the darkness of valleys and strife. Our cup runneth over. We praise you, dear Lord, for your blood that was shed, for our lives restored. Mere words can't express what wells deep within our gratefulness for redemption from sin. For the life yet to come, our heavenly reward, riches will claim your eternally stored. Not reserved for this day, our hearts pour out praise of thanksgiving and love we lift and we raise. Our gratitude and adoration to one we humbly acknowledge till thy kingdom come. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving.